singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you are watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show, you can help me make it better in several ways. You can write a brief review on it uh, for it on iTunes. You can click the like button on YouTube. You can leave a comment on the blog or on YouTube, or you can simply go and make a donation. Today, for the second time, my guest on the show would be well-known uh, economist uh, and professor at George Mason University, Robin Hansen. So welcome, Robin. I'm very happy to have you back on the show. I'm happy to be here. Fantastic. So for those of uh, our viewers who actually managed to watch part one of this uh, interview, which was about an hour and a half, and unfortunately uh, we failed to go sufficiently deep enough into Professor Hansen's ideas, um, as expressed um, in, in a draft uh, of a book that I've been very privileged to, to be reading for the past couple of weeks. So first of all, I want to say uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to read your book, uh, Robin. I really appreciate it. I, I hope it's very useful. Thank you. Well, um, let me put it this way. I hope it would be useful for the both of us. Uh, for me to, um, with your help, realize my mistakes and my failures in, in, in understanding some, some of your concepts, perhaps, and for you to perhaps utilize some of my criticisms in the final draft, because I have to admit that I've rarely disagreed more <laughs> and disliked more a, a, a book draft that I've ever read. Well, the, the reason for circulating a, a book draft uh, privately is to get criticism so you can change it and so that you don't embarrass yourself so much <laughs> later on when you make it public. I've already made a lot of changes in response to previous uh, critics, so I, I expect and hope to uh, change it in response to you, too. Fantastic. So um, let's dive right in. Let's not waste any more time. All right. So first of all, let's start with the title. What's your working title? Uh, at the moment, it was going to be uh, After the Dreamtime, uh, The Science of uh, Brain Emulate, Brain Societies. So it's the science of emulation societies, I think. And why after the dream time? Um, I have this essay that uh, a lot of people liked as a blog post, uh, which was about uh, our era as a dream time, and our era framed in historical context as a most extreme dream time era. So the idea was that uh, our very distant ancestors were very well adapted to their environment, and things were changing very slowly, and there was very little technological progress. And that also seems likely for our very distant descendants. Eventually, technology will slow down, our growth will have to slow down, and they will become very adapted to their environment. So at both bookends of the, of the history, creatures will be very well adapted to their environment. They'll also sort of be more local, in the sense that our distant ancestors lived in a very local society. They didn't have much awareness of, of the wider cousins across the world, and our very distant descendants spread across Space would also be fragmented into local cultures that didn't interact much with on the larger scale. Mm -hmm. But we uniquely are at a period of very high growth, a very rapid technological improvement, very rapid economic growth, very world integrated culture, and also a, a, a world of behavior and, and beliefs that are really out of filter with the world in the sense of being far from adapted behaviors and beliefs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's charming in many ways, and I think you know our descendants will look back on us as, as this uniquely interesting time uh, to tell stories about and to. Uh, Do you to, think they'd be envious of us? They'll be envious in some ways, yes, uh, but they'll also make fun of us in other ways, rightly so, for being these creatures who were so far out of kilter with their world, so deluded about so many things, and so uh, far out, far away from what they know and their our distant ancestors knew to be adaptive. Mm -hmm. So, Robin, one of the things is that, generally speaking, is that I found your view of the future very pessimistic and even depressing, to tell you the truth. Um, I hope you disagree with me. I, I hope that you think that your view of the future is not pessimistic. Well, I, I think it's neither extremely pessimistic nor extremely optimistic. That is, that is really what you should have expected from any detailed analysis of a future, is that it would end up being somewhere in the muddled middle, uh, it was. It isn't a heaven or a hell per se. So that's roughly what I think. It, it has many positive features, and on on the whole, I think it should. It would be good to accelerate it, its arrival. That is, on the whole, it would be a bit better than our world, but not heaven. 
So, uh, in the very beginning of your book, I think it's on, uh, on your draft, I should probably refer it to, because it would probably undergo quite a few changes uh, by the time it goes to publishing. You say that um, your goal is not to make a predict, to make, uh, um, you said, you say, let me read it to be more accurate. I instead seek social implications. What sort of social world would they live in? And then a little bit later you say, I'm mainly trying to foresee what will be rather than what should be, though, of course, I hope a few policy recommendations will follow. So tell us a little bit more about this idea about what will be versus what should be, because I have serious problems with it. Well, um, I expect many will, but in some sense, it's the essence of social science. Uh, in some sense, the essence of the social scientist perspective is the idea that there are predictable outcomes of societies uh, that you could know from knowing the context and structure and the technology and the people and their preferences. Uh, these are predictable outcomes you could anticipate. And while there'll be variation, they, they may be different cultures and different equilibria, there are still things you can say. And in some sense, uh, you could think of that as detracting from their free will or their, or their autonomy to make choices. Um, if you want, but uh, the, the essence of social science is the idea that we can make predictions about what societies would be like in their different circumstances. Here's, here's my problem with such a statement. When things are descriptive explicitly, they're also prescriptive implicitly. And here's what I mean by this. By saying that things will, will be this way, you're also saying that things will not be other ways. I, in contrast, would argue that in contrary to what you claim, things can be much worse and things can be much better. Therefore, I would like to argue that your argument is very deterministic, right? Because it says, here's what the outcome will be. I would like to say the outcome entirely depends on our actions that we are about to take in the next few decades, and things can go, therefore, much worse or much better than you claim. So, so let's make sure our, our listeners are up to date on the basic concept here. So th this is a book about uh, a future world of whole brain emulations, mm -hmm. trying to use social science to predict uh, basic features of this world. I explicitly say, as you say, that I'm, I'm trying to predict sort of a, a main scenario. Um, I, I explicitly say I'm trying to do what's called a baseline scenario. That is, um, when, when I think one outcome is much more likely than, than another, I will choose the more likely outcome as the element of the scenario. But when there are similarly likely outcomes, I will choose the one that's easiest to analyze because that makes the best reference scenario for the purposes of thinking about variations on it. So uh, that's, that's a compromise in the choice of the scenario between... Yeah, but the course of history doesn't take the, the easiest course to analyze. Usually it takes the craziest and hardest. So that means I explicitly acknowledge that my scenario will be biased in the direction of being understandable and less strange than reality would likely be. Um, the, the, the next thing you know to say is that um, you talk about can or could, and um, it's certainly possible that many things would happen, uh, but nevertheless something will happen. So there isn't necessarily a contradiction between saying what will happen depends on what we do and saying that we will make certain, we will make, will make some choices and we can try to predict what those choices will be. So I don't necessarily accept that you've disagreed with me yet. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, I, I want to make sure that the possibility of changing that final outcome that you're describing is explicitly stated rather than people sort of implicitly being snuck through the possibility that this is how the future will be. I just want to make that uh, explicit. Perhaps you can call that one of my biases. I mean, I watched a fantastic video of you talking about people's biases where you said, we're all biased and you think you know that we're biased, but it's actually much worse. We're much more biased than yep. you think we are, and you don't even know how much biased you are. I would like to say that I am very much so biased, but so are you. And I would actually try to bring forth some of those biases as we're going towards our discussion. It doesn't have much leverage until we get specific about what particular biases there, there might or might not be. Absolutely. So, I said, well, one bias clearly of choosing an, an easier to analyze baseline is that it will be less strange than the reality would be. Uh, clearly. 
one bias, perhaps, of choosing any scenario to describe is to somehow give the impression that it's the only possible scenario. So I've certainly said this isn't the only possible scenario, but nevertheless, you have to start somewhere in elaborating scenarios. And so that seems, this seems to be a good place to start with the most likely easiest to analyze scenario as a place to think about variations. Uh, another important thing to say is you, it's important to be realistic about the range of variation that's feasible. Uh, so if you, if you think that bigger changes are possible than are actually possible, you will, you will use up your precious energy and attention trying for things that just can't happen. So uh, you have to be somewhat realistic in knowing what's the range of possibility. And I think people often, especially futurists, get a little too far in thinking that, that they have more power or more choices than they do and that they could make a wider range of things happen than could happen. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very much part of our disagreement here is the, rate, the range of feasibility, as you called it, right? I think that it's very feasible that we, we have very different outcomes, and I just want to stress that. Okay. Well, I think a, a good way to think about that might be to say, take some representative person from the year 1500, representative people, and ask, what could they have done to make our world different? How different could our world have been if somebody in 1500 had done something different? That's, it's a good way to sort of set a reference point of how much change is feasible. Uh, so um, I would say that relatively modest changes are possible. Maybe you could have changed whether it was England or Spain or France that was the first site of the Industrial Revolution, perhaps, although that, even that's somewhat hard to imagine. You might have piv changed certain pivotal wars and who won in them. Uh, you might have uh, influenced like particular leaders, whether they were inspiring or whether they did particular... There's a saying that historians bring sometimes, and that is, if Cleopatra's nose was just an inch longer the whole history of the world would have been very different. I don't believe that. Do you? I absolutely believe it because... The world would be different. Well, what would we look like? If we look around the world, what, how, what's out your window different? If the it, whole conquest of Egypt, the whole uh, Egyptian dynasty, the, the whole sort of process of, of, uh, social, uh, of, of colonization of Egypt by Rome and... and all the sort of repercussions of effects throughout history, sort of the spillover effect, the chain reaction, would be humongous, I think. Well, so we have to... Or, or, or the processes going on in the world. And some processes going on are relatively fragile and have very strong path dependence. And other processes are more robust and don't that much depend on some of these details. So certainly wars and who wins wars and which empires are spread across which boundaries uh, depends on a lot of very subtle details, and those could easily have been different. Um, For example, Helen of Troy. I mean, you can argue maybe that's more of a legend, but we know that Troy did exist as a, as a country, as a city-state. Uh, and now there, there certainly were probably economic and other factors for the war, but Helen's beauty and her being stolen from Greece to Troy. Or generally imagining different people winning some of the major wars in history doesn't make that much difference for our world. It might make a difference which language we speak, it might make a difference which idols we have, which religions we follow, but it wouldn't necessarily change the way cars look or the way airplanes look. But societies would look very different if Hitler won World War II. You sure? Well, I, I would like to, to believe that our society is fundamentally different than the Third Reich. Third Reich would, would change just like our society has changed. So the question is, what would it have changed into by this point, not what was it at the time? So, I mean, during a war, uh, you know, things are particularly extreme. Our, our society was really quite extreme and not entirely praiseworthy in many ways during the war. I agree, but still it was infinitely better than, than both Stalin's and Hitler's. But concretely, what, what would look, look around you? What would be different? If, well... The, the, the social and political structure, the, the ability of people to make that choice that I'm fighting for, right, that feasibility option, right, you have much more feasibilities and possibilities and opportunities here in our society today than you would have had in the German society or in the Stalinist society, especially if you were a Jew, a gypsy, uh, a homosexual, uh, or so on. Okay, but so those are fundamental differences. Yes, maybe tanks and planes and cars would have looked the same, 
But our spectrum of possibilities would have been entirely different, and that changes everything, I think. But, but look at it from the point of view of somebody from 1500. If you need to explain our world to somebody from 1500, you have to go back to really basic things to tell them about our world. You have to tell them what cars and telephones are. You have to tell them about population. You have to tell them about medicine. There's just all sorts of very basic things you have to tell them about. By the time you got to explaining to them about how Jews were being treated by another particular culture, you would be way down in the details of the description of the world you've been giving to somebody in 1500. They would, it would, would not be near the first questions they would be asking. Well, if I tell them there's no more kings, for example, in self-respecting societies. Right. That's a pretty robust phenomena that, that would still be true. I mean, the Third Right would be a democracy by now. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, look, at, look, I was born in, in Eastern Europe, and I lived there for most of my life still. Um, and... They, the communist bloc survived for 50 years in Bulgaria, where I'm from, and in Russia for longer, and <laughs> it didn't come to democracy, not even yet, not now. I mean, you can argue now it's better and it's more democratic than it was, but for 50 or 70 years, respectively, between Russia and Bulgaria, it certainly didn't turn into a democracy. If we look at the large-scale trends in our society over the last few hundred years, we see a lot of consistent trends across societies that aren't depending on which particular political power, you know, ran which country at which time. Yes, which party ran which country at which time affects some things, but over time we see a lot of very consistent trends that don't seem to depend very much on those sorts of details. So from that the level at which I'm trying to describe a future society. So I, I, I think you, you noticed that I did not try to tell you which political parties would win or with us, which ethnicities would be at the top of the pyramid or anything. I would argue that you are, actually. I would argue that you are, but you're not saying it explicitly. You're saying it implicitly. <laughs> so anyway, let's not bog down in, in, in the very beginning, but let's, let's dive deeper into the details. So, so first of all, just very quickly with a couple of sentences, if we can sort of... Uh, uh, restate your view of the technological singularity as a definition, and then we can proceed to the view of how you see the future M's economy. Okay, I would just say that a singularity can be understood as a short period relative to previous trends where there is a very rapid increase in the overall growth rate of the economy and technology. Uh, two previous examples were the uh, farming revolution and the industrial revolution, both of which the growth rates of the economy increased by a factor of 100 or more. And so a future singularity would be another short period where within a smaller than a previous doubling time, i.e., say, in, within five years, the economy, world economy would transition from something familiar to this to something that grows 100 times faster, like you might double every month. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be what a singularity is. So then the question is, well, what could cause such a singularity? And I'm focused on the scenario that it's caused by the introduction of the technology of whole brain emulation, the ability to emulate entire brains uh, well enough to uh, reproduce the input-output behavior, and therefore the ability of those human brains to do useful work. Mm -hmm. So your argument is that the most likely uh, path towards artificial intelligence is creating whole brain uh, emulations, M's as you call them, and then you look at the effect that those M's would have on the total economy of our future. Right. I try to envision what that economy and society would look like. Again, weighing, taking the most likely, mm -hmm. something seems much more likely, and then taking the easiest to analyze feature when s several features seem roughly similarly likely. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this then. Uh, the two or three examples that you give of previous singularities that you uh, give as, as examples are the moment that we stop being hunter-gatherers hunter and turn into an agrarian society of farmers, and then the next one was the Industrial Revolution. Now, clearly, those were moments where uh, the mode of production, as if Karl Marx were here sitting with us, would say changed fundamentally. Just because Marx said it doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> Marx said a lot of wise and insightful things. Very, very good. I, I also think so myself. So... Uh, we noticed that the mode of production changed, and that led to huge social, political, and economic changes. 
Now, let me ask you this, and, and th then we have, you know, the changes of different uh, economic systems, right? So before that, we had feudalism, and after the Industrial Revolution, we pretty much had capitalism. Now, with this kind of singularity that you're describing, likely to happen, I am not noticing any sort of accompanying fundamental change of social, political, and economic character as it happened previously. In other words, in my view, capitalism is just like any other system. It is born, it lives, and it dies, just like slavery, just like feudalism. So I think uh, it probably is the best system that we have so far, but not in its own right, not because of its inherent good qualities, but because of lack of a better alternative, if you will, right? And, so and for this reason, I believe that it's very likely that when the mode of production changes from the Industrial Revolution into the M economy, as you call it, it is very likely that we would also switch to a new uh, system instead of capitalism, something else. So it's hard to understand what is supposed to be referred to when, when we have a big word like capitalism referring to a system. Um, as a social scientist, I'm more comfortable with breaking it down into various parts and talking about which parts are changing, which parts are staying constant. And so I can look back at the Roman Empire or the ancient Chinese Empire, and I can see lots of specific parts that are familiar and understandable in mm -hmm. our world, and I can see some particular parts have changed, but an awful lot of things have changed. Uh, so I don't know whether I should call the ancient Rome, Roman Empire capitalist or not. It seems somewhat unimportant. What I think it's pretty much a slave economy. Rome was built on the back of slaves, and I think that's that's the production. There are a lot of regions in the Roman Empire where, where slaves were a really small fraction of the workforce. So uh, I, there are a lot of ways in which it was not a slave economy. Uh, there are plenty of places in the ancient far, in the ancient farming world where slaves were a very minor element, and nevertheless, uh, there's a recognizable economy to understand and, and watch and, and and see how it worked. Uh, so. I mean, there were, big firms didn't exist back then. Uh, the largest organizations were government or, or armies, and those were relatively small and, and less organized than ours. But uh, a lot of familiar elements existed. Certainly cities and towns are a familiar structure that we recognized back then. Uh, uh, families uh, were, were a unit of organization. There was certainly commerce. There were trades. There was uh, even long-term investments of various sorts. Um, but, of course, many particular details have changed, and that's the kind of way I'm trying to project in the future. I'm trying to think about which organizations would become more prominent, which organizations would take on which roles, uh, who would hold what kind of property, uh, what sort of rights would be held. I mean, the, All I'm trying to do here is to point out that your argument perhaps would be stronger if you consider that these changes would also lead to commensurate changes in the mode of production. So before slavery, we had feudalism, slavery, feudalism, then capitalism, and I would argue there has to be another one coming down the pipe. I mean, I, I just disagree that uh, the farming world is intrinsically feudal per se or intrinsically slavery. Uh, before the Industrial Revolution, there was a, an economy and it had commerce, uh, one element of the commerce was often the owning of slaves, but there are slaves today. But there are, but they're marginal. Whereas if you take in, in, a, in an ancient city-state like, for example, Athens or Rome, and I'm not talking about the, the margins of the empire, I'm talking about Rome proper, the ratio between citizens and slaves was something uh, of one to four, maybe one to six or seven in some cases. Not representative of the overall population of the whole society, yeah, you know, 80% of the Roman Empire was not slaves, just not remotely close. Uh, so that, that's something true about Rome. I mean, the capital, of course, where, where power is concentrated and the wealth is concentrated, they're going to bring uh, slaves concentrated there, too. Uh, but, you know, we, we have the farming world encompasses this huge range of many different societies. And if you were trying to tell a forager about farming, you'd want to under, help them understand this range. And you'd want to first, like, tell them the common elements of the farming world. Just like if you're trying to tell a farmer about the industrial societies, our industrial societies have a lot of variation. They have a lot of different structures and a lot of different uh, ways things are organized. But there are still a lot of common elements you'd like to identify and you'd want to tell somebody about. And that's what I'm trying to do about this future emulation society. Just identify the most basic common elements that societies might have and point those out, even accepting that there could be a lot of different ways of running politics, a lot of different ways of organizing firms and productions, a lot of different uh, rules and regulations. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on then. Uh, so 
we figure out what's the singularity, what you mean by it. We figure out that you believe that the, the, the most likely pathway towards that singularity that you're describing is by creating uh, whole brain emulations. What happens next? Now, lead us, uh, envision us this, for us this picture of the future. Well, there are hundreds of details, as you, you noticed from the, the draft. Uh, so it's a matter of what to emphasize. Um, one of the things to, to emphasize is that um, reproduction happens via making copies, and that's cheap. That is, you can reproduce an adult and have a fully trained adult by making a copy. You don't have to train it all the way from a child again. Uh, and you can make as many copies as you have machines to put them into. So first, there is a very rapid population explosion because you can make many of these things and you make them very large. Uh, and that's going to induce a rapid fall in wages uh, down to the point where it's a near subsistence level wage. Um, that's a straightforward implication. Uh, you also have a lot of implications about, um, you know, the, the set of copies who are sort of copies of the same original have a lot of sort of natural allegiance and sort of ties to each other, and that becomes a natural unit of organization uh, uh, for finance and for production. Um, and then, uh, Let me just st stop you here and discuss a couple of details. So you said that um, uh, wages would naturally tend to drop to the price of hardware for uh, storing those emulations. Well, of the price of power, maybe four times. It maybe three or four times, yes. So, therefore, humans who would be competing against those uh, emulations would get paid equally to them or have to drop their wage requirements to be able to compete with them. Or more plausibly, simply give up <laughs> and use other sources of income. Okay, precisely. So I have a couple of problems here with this. So, so first of all, to me, that sounds like a very depressing, very dystopian uh, picture of the future, especially if, and that's a quote, that's accompanied by, quote, city centers that may literally glow, glow and sit under strong mushroom cloud-like updrafts. <laughs> so we have the vision of people, human beings, that is to say, not being able to compete or giving up uh, any potential for making a living, and city centers which are under a mushroom cloud. Okay. Now, if, if we had told uh, foragers about the farming revolution, we would have had to tell them that you foragers are going to be marginalized. Uh, most of the economic and social power is going to be in the farming world, and you guys are going to be on the periphery. Never, and in addition, if you go visit one of these farming villages, it'll look alien and artificial. It, it won't be a natural world. It'll be a, a world that's been changed into the world that these farmers like. Uh, but, but here's the difference. But here's the difference, right? When you had the Industrial Revolution and you had shepherds being forced into the, uh, you know, to becoming the proletariat, what Marx called, going into the city and finding a job, they still had the opportunity to earn a decent living and even climb up the social ladder and turn into capitalists eventually, right? In your case, this is out of the question because if you do not have at the moment of that M revolution, if you do not already have investments in real estate property or stock portfolio and st stuff like that, and you have been relying solely on wages to, for sustenance for you and your family, then you're basically doomed well, the analogy in the Industrial Revolution or the previous resolution is people who refuse to adapt to the new world, refuse to try to become part of it, insist on doing everything the old way, and then are disappointed to find that there's less demand for their services and products and that they are getting poor and perhaps even starving. Uh, that would be the analogy in both of those cases, is people who refuse to try to adapt. In, this, in my scenario, if you want to become an emulation, it's available as a path to you as a human, and you can join this new world and become part of it. You're, you're lamenting the people who refuse to join, who insist on staying back and doing things the old way, and then complaining that they aren't loved and adored. And, and My claim is that a strong society and a worthy society is one that allows people like the Amish to choose not to be part of that society and live in their own ways and according to their own choices. That's one of my claims. And my other claim is that in the past, you had the option of joining that society like the proletar like the shepherds moved into the city and some of them eventually became bourgeois, right? right. Yep. By starting a small business. 
in your case, unless you become a NEM, that is to say, unless you basically upload your mind into the machine and kill your body, then you have no option because your ability to sustain yourself physically outside of the emulations world is, is almost impossible, taken out of you. And I would say even further, what's even worse is that I didn't find a revolution as a serious option in your book. And I think that in a situation like this, and like it happened during the Industrial Revolution in late 19th and early 20th century, there would be a lot of violent resistance to that process. Because when people are hopeless to get better life within a system, they go against it and they start fighting it. Okay, but we, let's go back to basics. Okay. Uh, if you think about foragers in our world, it's extremely difficult to live life in anywhere near where you and I live as a forager. Uh, the Amish are not foragers. Amish have not kept the ancient ways going back millions of years. They are using relatively recent technology, maybe only a century ago. Sure, but you can still be on the African savanna or in some other places in Mongolia and stuff like that, and, and you can still live with the yurts. Relative to the world population of 7 billion, there's, you know, well less than a million of people living like that. I understand, but what I'm saying is that those people in the cities today, we were born there. The foragers of the world had a revolution somehow because to claim they are unhappy with the situation. It would not go very well. In order to have a successful revolution, you'll have to be on the basis of some substantial economic power that you can threaten with. Uh, so you'll have to have been making a substantial compromise to the new economic order in order to have a successful revolution. Uh, the people who were successful revolutionaries were those who were compromising and were part of the new economy. They weren't people who insisted on staying way off on the periphery and doing things the old way. Well, I didn't say it would be necessarily successful. I just said there will be a lot of violence and resistance to it. I mean, there was a, a Russian revolution, a peasant revolution in 1905 before the, the, the sort of 1917 revolution. And the, the 1905 one terribly failed. It was drowned in blood, basically, and the peasants were suppressed. And the peasants were mainly, you know, uh, serfs uh, rebelling against uh, feudalism. Well, I, revolutions make great stories uh, and they make even great movies. But it, if you were trying to talk to somebody in 1500 and telling them about the world around you and you insisted on telling them about revolutions, they might say, you keep talking about these revolutions. I see cars, I see houses, I see people going to jobs. Which of that is affected by those revolutions? And you'd have a hard time explaining to them how the basic features of the world they see had anything to do with these revolutions you keep wanting to talk about. No, what, what I'm saying is this, though. I'm, I'm saying something very different. If you go to somebody in the 15th century and say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to put this thing called computer here, and you are no longer needed and therefore I'm not going to pay you, and therefore you cannot pay for food for you, food or shelter for you, for your wife and for your three kids, or in the 15th century it would have been more like 10 kids, then I would say, and, and you do that on a large scale, I would say you have the perfect recipe of, uh, of a rebellion in, in the 15th century, and in fact this happened in many countries. Because... Over history, we consistently have introduction of new technologies and the choice of individuals to adopt the new technologies in ways or not to adopt them. You, you have new crops, you have new kinds of boats, you have new kinds of plows. Uh, all the way through history, you could have stood there and said, I refuse to adopt the new way and then get poor and then complain about it and then claim you should have a revolution. But that's really pretty a rare response to the opportunity to have a new kind of plow or a new kind of boat or a new kind of crop. It's funny how I sound like an anti-technology guy, but what I'm trying to say here is that there's a fundamental difference between this and what you're proposing, right? Because if you didn't have a boat, you can still walk, or you can ride a horse, or you have 10 other ways of, of commuting, right? If you didn't buy a musket, you could still have a, a, a bow and arrow, and you can go hunting with it. A little piece looks like you can do without it. You know, you can do without a smartphone today. You can, you can do without a car if you want today. You can do without a telephone. For, for each little a television, maybe. For each little thing, yes, you can do without it. But when you take all the things together and you try to do without all of them, you, you are really in a hard place. So if you try to be a forager in our world, if you try to go back, uh, you know, to 100,000 years ago technology and say, I'm going to live that way, it's extremely hard to do so. You can reject a few things, yes, 
because there's a variety of economic niches and, and not everybody has to be up on everything. But if you just reject everything wholesale, uh, you're going to have a really hard time. And that's, that's what my argument is partly, at least, that the people who reject that emulation economy wholesale would most likely take up arms and fight it because otherwise they would be physically unable to exist because they would not be able to buy food and shelter neither for them nor for their families. But I don't see how it is different from these past situations in which hundreds of new technologies have arrived and people have had the choice to either adopt them or not. It's fundamentally different. That's what I'm saying is because you could still eat out in the mountains when, you know, the first foragers became farmers. When the first farmers became proletariat and became workers in capitalism, you could still make a living as a subsistence living farmer. In the future that you're describing, all of those options are pretty much becoming increasingly impossible. But we're just talking about time scale. We're not talking about a fundamental difference. We're just talking about how fast things happen and how rapidly changes happen. So, uh, and, and how profound those changes are, because you're talking from taking the physical world into a digital realm. So I would argue that that's a radical change from the previous three singularities, which were physical singularities, and that will be a kind of a digital or virtual singularity. Sense that if you were a forager and you didn't adopt the farmer ways, that you were very much marginalized, or if you were a farmer and you didn't adopt the industrial ways, you were very you were marginalized. Uh, those degrees of marginalization are pretty much similar across all these revolutions. Though what's different, of course, is the rate of change. As change has gotten faster, you will see more of those changes compressed into a shorter time period. But the fundamental fact of the displacement of previous ways with, with new ways is uh, constant across these revolutions. These changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on. So tell us a little bit more about that society that you're describing. Well, as I said, uh, clans of copies of the same person would be a natural unit of organization. Mm -hmm. uh, individuals would uh, work for firms, of course. Uh, firms would be larger because the world would be larger and has more place for them. Um, cities would be larger and more concentrated because um, at the moment cities are limited by congestion costs of traveling, uh, commuting across them, uh, and emulations would have a far lower uh, cost of traveling effectively to do their meetings. So there would be basically you know, a half dozen perhaps very large, very dense cities, for which, you know, would be very unfriendly to nature near in their immediate vicinity, uh, as mm -hmm. low and have uh, large mushroom clouds overhead. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they would be hosting trillions of these emulations, uh, who would most likely be running much faster than humans, so be perhaps a thousand times faster as a typical speed. Uh, and so if they some of them will do physical jobs, and when they take on a physical job, they have a physical body, and those physical bodies would be proportionally smaller for a proportionally fast emulation. So uh, instead of being two meters tall, they'd be uh, two millimeters tall if they ran a thousand times faster, uh, if they're working on a nanofactory or other small things. Uh, they uh, would uh, put form teams together. Well, teams would typically, say, be created together. All the copies of a team would be made together, all together, one team, and they'd be encouraged to socialize inside the team because that would give a more reliable performance. Teams would do a set of ta related tasks, and then there'd come a point where the set of related tasks uh, are no longer needed, or perhaps there's another team who'd be substantially more productive, and then that team would be retired. Now, uh, retiring... Uh, could still allow an indefinite lifespan for as long as they had, you know, a substantial subjective life. If they had worked for, say, 10 years on this task, uh, then when they retired, they could retire forever, uh, but at a much lower speed because the cost of running these things is proportional to their speed. So if they run one, if they run a retiree a thousand times slower than the original worker, then it only costs a thousand times, one thousandth the price to run the retiree. So let me stop you here for a second and, and bring two points and t you tell me where I'm wrong. So, I'm t we're talking about retiring and uh, running uh, emulations at different speeds. Right. So let's take the retiring option first. How is it that you foresee an economy that perhaps doubles every week or every day or every few hours, as you say, and yet you foresee skills that are going to last 10 years? For me, it's I a logical thing. 10 years subjectively. So if you're running a thousand times faster, that 10 years happens in a month. 
Okay, so so that's that's a good point. But still, does that mean that you're going to retire those emulations after those subjective ten years? It would actually be three days. I'm sorry, I got the number wrong. Three um, days, even better. So so in real time, our let's say, let let's not call it real, but let's call it human time. Three days will be equal to ten years of those emulations. So you retire them after those three days human time? Because as you say in the in the book, um, as minds get older, they become less and less flexible and therefore less and less capable to be retrained for new skills. And my argument is that in a very fastly doubling economy as the one that you're describing, of it doubling every few hours at some point, then the skills would go equally fast obsolete. That's right. So I actually said, I think I said more of my best guess is like doubling every week or month. Uh, but so if we take a reference point like that, what I actually said that when you try to decide how fast to run the M's, you'd be making a trade-off between having an M who does many tasks and, and across scope or a trade-off across time. So you can either have a guy do one thing really well over and over and over again over a long career, or you can have him do several related things and coordinate those tasks well. When you say a long career, you mean subjectively speaking long? Right, so, uh, until the point where their mind becomes fragile and, and less adaptable to whatever changes are happening. Mm -hmm. And that could be in three human days. It, well, it, it might be. So the, the whole point is that you would typically choose to match the time scale over which the job would change on the time scale over which the minds got fragile. You'd say, if the job's going to change every month radically anyway, we might as well run them so that they wear out in a month. So here's the core of my argument here, okay? So, uh, specific to this issue, so you are forcing a situation in which you need to create consistently more and more new M's to fulfill every three days, the needs required, the new skills required for that new economy as it sure. self-created itself by doubling three days ago. And another three days ago and another three days ago, it's an exponential. Yes. Therefore, the population growth of those M's would be exponential. And if you are retiring those M's three days after, let's do the math and see how much in human time forward into the future that becomes entirely un unsustainable in terms of hardware storage capacity because very quickly most of the M's that you're talking about would be retirees and a very small part would be active M's contributing to the society. Uh, but the point is that, uh, to be clear, the cost of running an M goes linearly as at speed over a wide range. So if you run one a thousand times faster, it costs you a thousand times as much to support that M. Mm -hmm. If you run a thousand times slower, it only costs you one thousandth of that. So if you have a thousand retirees for every worker, but those thousand retirees run ten thousand times slower, well, then you only have a ten percent, so only ten percent of your costs go for those retirees. But that's my other problem here, that, as I said, right? And that's, in my view, total discrimination because, first of all, if you have earned your keep, so, so to speak, and even if you haven't, just on basic M rights, I would claim that you're entitled to not be run a thousand times slower. But especially if you've actually paid for the next generation to exist in the first place by working for ten subjective years, that is three human days, and then you're being turned down by a factor of a thousand, that's for me a discrimination, and that creates... It's discrimination. That's the whole point. Uh, so we're, we're talking about labor economics and labor markets and what kind of jobs people will choose and what kind of work life they'll choose and what kind of retirement they'll choose. And I'm using standard economic analysis, which tries to match the, the, the demand for work, the various kinds of jobs and tasks that need to be done and the various willingness of various uh, employers and, and customers to pay for those tasks to be done, and the supply of labor, which is based on the various willingness of people to do different kinds of jobs and have various kinds of uh, wages and compensation, including uh, retirement for those. And so, uh, of course, the whole point is to discriminate and to distinguish, to um, give different people different things uh, as they wish and as their capabilities uh, are and, met. And here's my bias here, so let me make it explicit, right? My bias is this. You know, I am socially speaking libertari libertarian, which is to say, um, to paraphrase, so for issues like, for example, marriage or any social issue, I, I think the government shouldn't get involved in you. Or as one past 
Canadian Prime Minister said the government doesn't have any place in people's bedrooms, for example. So if you want to have gay marriage, be my guest. I have absolutely no problem with that. If you want to have a religion, that's fine by me too, as long as it doesn't hurt other people. Now, where I stop being libertarian is when it comes to economic policy. And that's to say that, you know, I very much respect economics, and I believe it is a good and useful tool, but I do not worship it. And here's the major bias difference between what I believe me and you is. You, I think, have a, an implicit bias towards economic efficiency. In other words, you, ethically speaking, put primacy on economic efficiency. I, in contrast, put ethically bias on social outcomes like equality, like justice, like non-discrimination, freedom, and so on. And I believe that when you have such deeply entrenched economic differences like the ones that you describe in your draft, one person running a thousand times faster than another person. Another thing which really bugged me is that the fact that you propose that we abolish the one person, one vote system. And, and not only that some people would be running a thousand times faster than others, but they would get to actually have a thousand times more votes. And that eliminates all kinds of upward mobility, which is one of the great advantages of our system. And, and that is the fact that you can be born very poor, but you can reach the top levels today. And in your system, that would be practically impossible because the people at the top would have the ability, or the M's at the top, would have the ability to suppress, suppress any upward mobility because they control the resources. Okay, but so your speech so far is in normative mode about what you want to have happen, what you like, what you wish happens. And the analysis is intended to be about what would happen or what does happen. So if you look in the past, you can see that relatively little of the structure of societies in industrial world or in the farming world have been very oriented around these wishful ideas about the equality you'd like to promote or the, the way you'd like people like to be treated. In fact, people have been treated quite unequally, consistently, across societies, across the world, across time. But here's the, here's the difference. I think that... The to the extent that we have made progress on any of those normative issues, and they are normative, and you are absolutely right, my argument is entirely or predominantly normative, I am very explicit about it, right? And economics, especially uh, libertarian laissez-faire economics, implicitly values economic efficiency, and that's why I started the way I started our discussion today not be true about economics, but we're talking about something much more basic here. We're talking about the possibility of social science, about predicting what does happen, even if it's not what you want to have happen. So set aside economics, sociologists, anthropologists, they'll also tell you the world is full of inequality. This is not something, e and they will predict inequality. I agree. About how inequality naturally shows up. I it's agree, but, but there's not, nothing natural about that inequality showing up, is what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this inequality is a result of our thinking and of our actions and it's a natural result of those and naturally if you change our thinking and our actions you can change the outcome so, well, how far can you change our thinking then becomes the key question well look we live in a very problematic deeply troubled world and still I believe that if you compare that world to you know the world that we lived in 2500 years ago I think in most ways we're making progress. We are freer, freer than them. We have more options. We have more opportunities. Women are not suppressed. Minorities are not suppressed. Because we made clever choices. We are rich because we're in the industrial era. That's why we are, we are doing well. It's because we are rich. So I would say we have made very little abstract moral progress. What we've, what's happened is by becoming rich, we've been more able to indulge our various feelings that we've always had and that go way, all the way back to the forager era. People today are simply acting out their wishes of, of what they would like a forager world to be like. Foragers are more democratic. They're more egalitarian. They spend more time in leisure. They're more promiscuous. Uh, in many ways, uh, what we have become over the last century as rich industrialists is what foragers are and were and what farmers were not. We, we have taken our wealth and decided to go back to what felt more right, what felt more natural, which is the forager way of doing many things. 
You see, I, I have to disagree again that, you know, our improvement in normative terms is a result of the fact that we're richer. I can give you many examples of rich societies that failed to make that, that jump, both in history and even nowadays. And, and one of the, the most important facts is that I, I think unless you have some kind of egalitarian distribution of that wealth, that wealth is meaningless because the Romans and the Athenians were very rich compared to most of their contemporaries across the globe, right? The same applied to many other societies. But that doesn't mean that, normatively speaking, they were a just society because they weren't. I'm not talking about whether it's a just society. My main claim is social science is possible. And social science is possible only if you can predict what people actually choose. Yes, what happens depends on what people choose. But, but people actually don't always choose on, on say, rational uh, economic analysis. But we can still predict how they choose, and therefore we can use our understanding of social science to predict how the future will choose. And therefore, I can use that to predict how a world of emulations will choose and what it would be like, using the same social science we now use to predict the past, to understand historical societies, to predict cultures around the world. The, whole, the, the, the fundamental claim here is that we have a social science, and it does help us predict what choices people actually make. Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying that people can make choices which are different than the ones you claim we do. Economic choice, which in economic terms don't make any sense in the short term in, in particular. For example, when you become a soldier or when you sacrifice your life, you're doing those choices against your rational self-interest for normative reasons. And I, I also would say that normative reasons are those things that inspire us to move forward rather than... But the, but normative, a descriptive analysis of normative feelings is part of social science. Social science includes observing that people have normative feelings, that they have feelings of fairness and, and aversion to inequality, and using what we observe in the past about how those feelings have expressed themselves and what people have done about them to make generalizations about what people tend to do and what typically happens, and use that part of social science to predict what happens when people act on those sorts of feelings. Robin, I very much am enjoying this conversation, but uh, before we continue, I want to ask you, how are you doing on time? How much more for our discussion do you have to know how to pace myself? I could certainly handle another 15 minutes. Another 15 minutes. Okay. So let me give you the word then. So let, let's, let's move on. Or if you want, I, I can just uh, throw in a bunch of uh, general issues and you can tell me why I'm wrong. Or, or you might not be. So... So, uh, as I said, I have problems with the fact that you're uh, against uh, one vo person, one vote uh, system. I have problems against, uh, you know, discriminating with respect to uh, overclocking some and downclocking other emulations. I have problems with the social disparities that that entail. I have problems with the social punishment system of how you, you suggest that if one member of a team... Wait. Can we just say that you have problems with those things in our society too, right? You Absolutely, of course, of course. This could happen as I describe, and you could then have problems with it, just like you have problems with our real society around us today. Absolutely, and I think we should be resisting it in our society just like we should be resisting it in yours. I'm not claiming you shouldn't resist it. I'm not, I'm not against your resistance, but I'm still trying to make a best guess prediction about what actually will happen, just like I'd make a best guess prediction about what's actually happening in our world when you do something. But that almost precludes the possibility of us making any progress. That's my problem, is because I s firmly believe that we have improved tremendously for the past 2,500 and, or 10,000 years. And after such a radical event that you're describing and the economy doubling every week, I believe that the minuscule improvement, if any, and I think I would actually argue it's a, a regress rather than progress of what you're envisioning for the future, uh, and I think that change warrants a much bigger, much more fundamental, normative, positive impact on our society. Because we would be swimming in, in we'll be rich, as you said. I mean, that society is supposedly much yeah. richer than ours. To be really clear about it, even if I'm, I guess I'm repeating myself, the key analytical framework as a social scientist is, is to say, we know a lot about what people actually do and what typically happens, and we have a social science many social sciences built around that that help us predict what will happen. But 
that's the basis for our normative analysis. Economists are most explicit among the social scientists for doing normative analysis in a very standard, straightforward way. And as you say, it is more efficiency-based. But the point is to say, first pick a reference scenario, what you would think might happen if you did nothing. And then think on the margin, if, if you change things, move things in one direction or another, which way gets better? And so we have a whole structure to help us analyze which directions would, in fact, be better if we move things in those directions. And then we do think that, in fact, you typically can't move them very far. That is, in the experience of actual worlds is that people have relatively limited ability to make changes to their worlds. It definitely matters which changes they make. We want to help them figure out which changes to make and to recommend the better changes. But we shouldn't presume that... that but it depends what you mean by relatively little ability to make changes. I, I'd like to offer two suggestions, right? According to your analysis, uh, when the American Civil War happened and when the abolition of slavery came, that was not a feasible option. That, that, that was not a very big change. Or likewise, when the Soviet Union collapsed against all prediction in a very peaceful manner, mind you, right, all social sciences like political science and, and etc., especially based on the previous history uh, of the Soviet Union and, and Stalinism and so on, everyone and everything would have pointed towards a very bloody confrontational and and, and, and a total mess uh, of a collapse and probably war with the West for the so as a requirement for the Soviet Union to collapse. And yet both slavery was abolished and the Soviet Union collapsed. And, and I think those are huge changes that happened on a normative basis where people took a normative action. But our social science predicts that things like that happen. And it's part of the predicting the world and what will happen is to predict that things like that happen. But as you say, those events and those causal processes are really pretty noisy. It's pretty hard to predict exactly the consequences when you start down a path like that where you will go. So as I've said, some of the things that are the hardest to predict that because they are the most random are which exact parties or, or ethnicities or nations are in charge of which regions, which particular laws they have, when the laws, you know, are only modestly affect their efficiency. Um, I, I think, I think one of the key ideas here is that a, a world that is more competitive has fewer options to choose things different than whatever is the most efficient. So, as, as we are very rich in our society, we are actually have a lot of leeway to choose laws and, and, organ and um, rules and things that make us much less efficient, but we have vast wealth to waste, and so we can waste wealth if we choose by setting up uh, various things that, that are, are wasteful. In a world that's very competitive, that's really much more on the edge of survival, it's just much harder to make such choices without simply going away. And so which word... Which world would you want to be a part of? And I, I already, I think I'm pretty clear which one I would choose. Well, that's, that's my point. Uh, this is the dream time, and we, and we of the dream time love our dream time, and we think all the future should be like it. But most likely the future will not be like the dream time. It will be much more like the past, and their creature will be full of creatures who are in a more competitive situation with fewer options to make radical different choices about the world because uh, they are more competitive. That, so that's what I find so depressing about your book, going back to the beginning, right? Because I think in a world that we live today, single individuals can make bigger chance, changes to our world in any way possible than ever before, be it normatively speaking, economically, technologically, socially, religiously even, if you will, or in any other way. And also... I believe that we have to, as a society, be able to accommodate. You know, I love technology. I will definitely not side and join the Amish colonies here in, North, in Ontario. We have quite a few of them, actually. But I would like to ensure that people like that are able to make that choice. And I think that the value of a society as a whole comes out of the way it treats its most vulnerable members. Well, you like living in a rich world, which, of course, uh, most everybody does. It's good to be rich. Uh, th these are, you know, long uh, truisms, yes. And so are we going to be poorer in your world, in a more competitive world? You mean 
personally speaking, right? Because if the economy is doubling every week, then the world in general would be much richer. But individuals will have less leeway in the sense that the, the typical individual will be much closer to the edge of survival and, and be forced to take But on. then what's the point of it, Robin, right? If the world is doubly rich every week and if I'm doubly poor every week, what's the damn point? Well, the point is that real poor people like their lives. They smile. They enjoy their lives. Maybe they don't like your, their life as much as you like yours, but it's valuable to have people who like their lives existing. And this is a world with trillions or perhaps quadrillions of creatures who enjoy their lives. But it's, it's quadrillions of creatures who work for three days, then they get retired and done clocked by a factor of a thousand. Also, oh. by the way, one thing that you mentioned in your book is if they don't pay rent and they haven't earned their retirement, they get deleted. Uh, which I would call it murder, by the way, and you and they would be constantly struggling to survive, and let alone the fact that, physically speaking, physical embodied old-fashioned human beings like us would be very hard-pressed to exist. And ancestors, our foragers, who, you know, for a million years perhaps, uh, lived the life of a forager, we being near the edge of survival. Uh, do you think it, that was a vast wasteland of uselessness, and it's only in your recent generations that any life has had value? No, but that's what Thomas Hobbes called uh, the, the time period when life was nasty, brutish, and short. And I, for one, don't look forward to going back to that kind of existence. It was so nasty, brutish, and short that it had almost no value. Or do you think your ans distant ancestors had lives of value? Of course, of course. But what I'm trying to say is, as us people who I believe are the primary movers of history and, and of progress... We have to be able to steer the future into a direction in which we'll be better off and our uh, descendants will be better off than us, rather than getting poorer and poorer, as you describe it. Between how, how, how luxuriously rich any one of them is and how many of them there are, I mean, don't you see some value in there being a lot more of them, even if each one isn't ridiculously rich? I, well, no, but if they're at the, at the sort of survival borderline, Right? I don't see much value of having trillions of people at the survival borderline because you can't really do anything other than struggle for survival at that borderline. Anything that makes us human, like art, creativity, culture, literature, happens when you actually go above your means. I only have a few minutes here, but I think this is a key point, and I think this is a, a key issue. It's a divide uh, between a variety of people in our, in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, many people who are, say, artists or journalists or uh, other sorts of um, people who get to express themselves and, and be very self-determined, and they've decided that lives which aren't like theirs are not worth living. That a person who does a job like drive a truck or, or cook food uh, according to a routine schedule, their lives are just a waste, and it's as if they shouldn't have, have existed. But that's how almost all your ancestors ever lived, and they were mostly happy. A hunter is a pretty routine life. Hunting is a pretty routine activity. Gathering is a pretty routine activity. Farming is. Through almost all of history, people had relatively routine jobs, but they enjoyed their lives. It Emulation is a pretty routine activity, in your argument. Well, the, my argument is if you think about this future world, it's actually quite a bit better in the sense that they have no need really for pain or hunger or cold or disease. Uh, they're... they're context they live in can be a spectacular virtual reality of spectacular artistic and inspirational quality uh, and they will be focusing on a large fraction of their time doing jobs, but jobs that are office jobs, complex jobs where they have meetings, where they have to do reports uh, it's a complex economy, a complex industrial economy with lots of coordination required, lots of structure, lots of specialization and in our society people with those specialized jobs tend to have happy lives. And it's not just happy lives when they go home. They can have a decent life on the job. That is, most people roughly think their jobs are okay and they get satisfaction out of doing their jobs. I think most people live lives of quiet desperation, and I think you even quote that in your book. And lives of quiet desperation can be lives worth living. <laughs> okay, Robin, I know you generously gave us an extra 15 minutes, so you, I would give you the last three or four minutes entirely, and I would not interrupt you to say whatever you want to say, both as a parting message or as a sort of a general picture in support of your book and ideas, more importantly. I appreciate uh, all the 
discussion we've had, and I, and I, you know, I certainly appreciate that these are important uh, feelings people will have. Um, so to go back to basics, we talked about in our last interview. For the most part, people don't actually care about the future. They want to use the future as a backdrop to talk about things today, to express themselves, to express things they care about today. So certainly, people are unhappy with inequality. They're unhappy with many features of the world. They're unhappy with routine jobs, or they're unhappy with. Uh, the fact that some people are hungry and other people are rich, they're unhappy with the, the fact of, of sickness, uh, of war, of, of, of prejudice. Uh, there's lots of things people are unhappy about today, uh, and there's lots of disagreements people have about what lives today are most worth living, who should be most respected. And people tend to u- try to take the future and use it as a backdrop to, t- to have those same battles out, to talk about whether you should, women or should be, the women who have more children should be respected or the ones who go to work should be respected or whether journalists and artists should be respected or the businessmen who make a lot of money should be respected. These are all disputes we have in our society and we play out these same disputes in talking about the future and we want to approve of societies in the future that, that basically praise people like we think should be praised and disapprove societies in the future who, who, who seem to praise things that aren't the ones we think should be praised in our society. But we actually don't actually care that much about the particular real future people. So most future scenarios that are discussed about are scenarios that are arranged to help you play this game of praising or blaming people to doubt indirectly through the future. But when you actually look at a real particular future that's likely to happen, it's going to be a lot more complicated and it's going to be a lot harder to identify who to praise or blame about it or even who in that society you like or what you should do about it. It's going to be a mess just like your society is. It's actually pretty dang hard in our society to figure out exactly what to do in any partic- about any particular issue because there's all these interconnected factors. That's also going to be true about the future. So you have to expect that if you do a careful, thorough job trying to project the future, it's going to be a complicated mess. It's going to be hard to figure out what exactly should you should do to make things better or worse. And you should also expect that it will be different than your society in the sense of what kind of things are most raised up and praised and what kinds of things are criticized. Uh, we are different from our ancestors. If, if a farmer from 1500, a typical farmer, had sees our world and we describe it to him, they would have many complaints about it. They would have many things they didn't like about us, that we lost our respect for our ancestors, that we were more promiscuous, that we had less faith, uh, that we had less respect for authority. These are all things they would deeply and sincerely, and perhaps from their point of view, correctly criticize our society for, if they could anticipate us. And if we could clearly see a a future society, we would probably similarly complain about it and celebrating things that we think shouldn't be celebrated or not celebrating things that we think should be. And that's what you should just expect generically if you understand clearly a particular future. Nevertheless, I hope... (laughs) that some people are actually willing to look through a careful analysis trying to project what the future would actually be like, enough to think about what we might do to help them, or at least not hurt them, uh, toward getting the things that they want for themselves. So I'm enough of an economist to say what I mainly want to do in analysis is to find out how to give the people what they want in their own terms. Not how to make them want what I think they should want, but how to give them what they want. So, you know, I'd be sort of liberal on drug liberalization because I think, well, some people seem to like drugs and and maybe I don't like them, but if they like them and they're getting enjoyment out of that, okay, we should help them with it. Now, if that's hurting other people as an externality, then I want to take that into account. But otherwise, I want to get people whatever they want. So I want to think about this future world of emulations. I want to say, well, what would their lives be like? What do they typically want? And how can I get them more of that? And if they're in a world that's a different culture, it celebrates work more, it celebrates allegiance to a, a clan family more, maybe accepts more inequality. I don't want to go preach to them and tell them they should be more like me and my, my society. I want to tell them, I want to just help them get what they want and maybe make the world a little bigger, a little happier, a little more peaceful. And that would be a life worth living for me. Robin, uh, thank you very much for taking time to be with us. I would like to end our conversation with my favorite quote from your book, the one that I 100% agree with and support. And that's on page, po- uh, on page two where you say, we take far more effort to study the past than the future, even though we can't do anything about the past. People often excuse this by saying that we know a lot more about the past but we would know a lot more than we do about the future if we tried harder. Yes. <laughs> so, Dr. Robin Hansen, I mean, Professor Do- Robin Hansen, thank you very much for being with us today. Take care.